uh, we're doing a series. We've been doing it for the last three months on the cross. It's all about what Jesus did for us 2,000 years ago when he gave his life for us. Nothing should stir our hearts as Christians, as followers of Jesus, more than the cross of Christ. Each week, we're looking at a benefit to us because of what Jesus did when he gave his life there on the cross. We're looking at the fact that he redeemed us. He set us free. That he took our place, substitution. He died in our place, bearing our sins upon himself. We're seeing that Jesus uh, justifies those who put their faith in him. Justify, declare righteous, make us righteous. And today, we're going to be looking at one of the most important themes in all the Bible. And that is the military theme that we're given in Scripture, the military conflict theme. And this theme focuses on the fact that Jesus is our hero who has rescued us by conquering our enemy. Jesus is our champion. And to understand what this means, we need to think in terms of a cosmic confrontation. Cosmic means it's universal. Cosmic means it affects heaven and earth. Confrontation means that it is a battle going on. It is a hostile meeting between opposing forces. On one side, you have the Lord God of Sabaoth. That's a Hebrew word that means armies. The Lord God of armies. And on the other side, you have the enemy who deploys the principalities and powers of the air to deceive and to harm us. You can read about that in Ephesians 2.2 2, and also in Ephesians 6.12 about this spiritual battle and warfare that we're engaged in. So folks, there is a cosmic battle going on. That needs to be basic to our theology or to our understanding of life. And Jesus came to liberate us from powers that we cannot defeat on our own. These powers are the power of sin, the power of death, and the power of the evil one, the devil. Sin, death, and the devil. These are the big three. And if they're to be defeated, it's going to have to be entirely a work of God. It is not us plus God achieving the victory. There's no us in the equation. It's solely Jesus. It is He who has defeated these powers. That's why all praise and glory belongs to Him. That is the gospel story. Jesus came to our rescue. And as we think about that, that can be best described by this sound. Listen. Hey! That's the Calvary charge. Many of you know that. It's not F Troop. Some of you remember that show from the 70s. This is Jesus to the rescue. This brings me to my main point for my message today. And that message, main point is, through the cross, Jesus defeated the powers aligned against us. He defeated the powers aligned against us. And regarding this victory, 1 John 3.8 says, The Son of God appeared for this purpose. Why? To destroy the works of the devil. So think of Christ's first advent when Jesus came into our world, born as a baby, raised right there in Israel, Bethlehem and, and, and the region of Israel. He came. It was, we need to view it as an invasion by God to retake for himself the world that he created. And our situation is so desperate that God had to fling himself into the battle. He had to personally and sacrificially get involved because nothing less would do. That was what is at stake at the cross. There are four main passages that I want to focus on today that describe and illustrate Jesus' victory over these hostile powers. Let's look at them together. The first passage I want to look at is Hebrews chapter 2, 14 and 15. The author of Hebrews writes in verse 14, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, since we 
are mortal, flesh and blood. He himself, Jesus, likewise also partook of the same, became flesh and blood. That, here's his purpose, through death, his death, he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. And folks, this is great news. Before Christ, we were subject to the fear of death. All of humanity was. But Jesus came to set us free from that fear. And he did it by defeating the power of death. Notice what brought the victory. It was through Jesus' own death on the cross. Why death? Because there is no greater expression, no greater sacrifice than one can make for another than to lay down his life, to give his life for another. And Jesus was willing to do that for us. Why death? Because the penalty of sin is death. And Jesus came to bear that penalty there on the cross for you and, my, for you and I. When Jesus paid the price for our sins by dying in our, play, our place, he freed us from the power of death. Death no longer has dominion over us. Life does. God does. Jesus does. So we don't have to fear death anymore. When it's our time to go, we go right as a believer in Christ who has put our faith in Jesus. When it's your time to go, you go right from here right into God's presence. The Bible says absent from the Lord, present. Or absent from the body, present with the Lord. We go right into God's presence. 2 Corinthians 5.8 tells us that victory. So, this brings us to our second passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55 through 57. This is a great passage. Paul's been talking about the resurrection of those who know Christ and put their faith in Christ. And, and he writes this in verse 55. He, he taunts death. This is kind of bold. Imagine taunting death. He says, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Where's your power? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law that convicts us, that condemns us as violators of God's perfect standards. But then verse 57, Paul, you can just see him with his hand up, his fist pumping. But thanks be to God, thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives her the full title there. He uses the word Lord. And this isn't just being, you know, ceremonious. This isn't just an insignificant add-on. When he says Lord, it's significant. It means Jesus has dominion over all the powers arrayed against us. He is the one who brings victory over these powers. By calling Jesus Lord, the Bible is saying Jesus is the ultimate power. The ultimate, not the devil. Not sin, not death. Jesus is the supreme power, and there is none his equal. If you want to read more about that, read Colossians chapter 1, 13 through 18, where it talks about the preeminence, the first place status of Jesus in all of creation. Nothing can equal him. And when we put our faith in Jesus as sinners and trust in him and him alone for our salvation, the power of sin, the power of death, and the power of the devil no longer have dominion over us. That's the victory. That's the good news. This is what the Bible means when Paul's writing. Often he'll use this little phrase, in Christ. I don't know if you've ever come across it. When you read the Pauline letters, you'll see this over and over again. We are in Christ. What does that mean? It means we're in the circle, the sphere of Christ's dominion. Yes, we have a relationship with Christ. Therefore, we're under the sphere of His power and protection. And you say, well, I don't feel very victorious right now. I, as Whitney shared in her song, you know, I, we go through struggles and we say, okay, God, I'm supposed to be victorious. I don't feel very victorious. Well, the Bible talks about realities that we have now but have not yet fully experienced. The phrase is now, but not yet fully. We are saved now, but not yet fully. We haven't fully experienced what salvation is going to mean and bring when Jesus comes again. So we are 
set free from these powers of sin, death, and the devil. Now, it's true, the victory has been won on the cross, but we aren't experiencing them fully yet. Now, but not yet. And notice again who Paul uh, celebrates as the one who brought us this victory. In verse 57, he says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who makes it possible for us to have victory over Satan, over sin, and over death. This brings us to our third passage, Colossians 2, 13 through 15. There the Apostle Paul writes, When you were dead in your transgressions and uncircumcision of your flesh. Let me just pause right there and say that this is a spiritual reality that is true for every human being. You are dead spiritually. Dead people can't help themselves. Have you ever noticed that? Dead people can do nothing to improve their condition. They're dead. Spiritually, we were dead. That means where there is nothing you and I can do to help ourselves before God. Nothing. We were dead, helpless. And we were dead in our transgressions and the uncircumcision of our flesh. And he says, the good news is he made God made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all of our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And He, that's Jesus, has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. That's the redemption theme. Jesus has paid the price for our sins. They have been taken out of the way. And then we have the military conquest theme. It says in verse 15, when he, Jesus, had disarmed the rulers and the authorities, spiritual powers, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through it, i.e. through the cross, is how we achieve the victory. Here we have the military image of Jesus triumphing over foes and making a public display of them as it were. This is a picture of what happened in the Roman Empire. No army in the Roman Empire could bring its troops into the city of Rome. They were afraid of insurrection, some general taking over the city. So you were forbidden to bring armed troops into the city, except on parade day. After a major victory in one of the provinces, uh, you were allowed as the victorious general to come with your troops and all the captives who you have brought, and have a parade through the city of Rome. And that's the image that Paul is talking about here. The captured enemy is the principalities and powers of the air. And they come behind Jesus, who is the conquering general. It's a beautiful picture. And it's an image of military conquest. Jesus has defeated the evil one. He has defeated the forces of darkness. And the good news to us is His triumph is our triumph. His victory is our victory. And there's no victory like the victory that we have in Jesus. None. You know, we celebrate the Mariners whenever they win, if they win. Come on, give me a break. We celebrate the Seahawks when they win. Not too much lately, but we celebrate them when they win. It's our home team. But nothing should compare to the celebration that we have because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. That's where our, our happiness, that's where our, our victory is centered. And this brings us now to our fourth passage. This is a very interesting passage. It's found in Luke chapter 11, verses 20 through 22. Now the context of this passage, the background, is Jesus has been accused by the Pharisees, think legalists, of casting out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of the demons, another name for Satan. So they're saying, oh, he only has power to cast out demons because he's relying on the power of Beelzebub. Now Jesus responds by saying, come on guys, this makes no sense. It would mean that Satan is defeating his own troops. Why would he do that? And that's when Jesus said the, the line that we often remember, that a house divided against itself cannot stand. Then Jesus said this, and I want you to look at this, in verses 20 through 22. Jesus said, 
But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, that is, by the power of God, then the kingdom of God, His fear of authority has come upon you. Now, think of a military invasion. He goes to this analogy. He says, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger, that's Jesus, when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all of his armor, his power, on which he had relied and distributes his plunder. Notice what Jesus is teaching here. Again, the image is one of violent conquest. In this case, a home is being broken into and plundered. Now, normally, the home, the person there guarding the home is the good guy. The person breaking in is the bad guy. It's just the reverse in this story. You need to understand that. I don't know if you've ever had your home broken into. It's a terrible thing. But in this analogy, what he's teaching is the person who is the strong man with the possessions is Satan who's holding us captive. He is the strong man. And what it requires is someone even stronger to come and bind the strong man and set us free. That's what's being taught here. We are held captive by powers too strong for us to defeat on our own. The strong man, again, represents Satan. He is the one, the strong man, guarding the house. The Bible refers to him basically as the tyrant of our world, the small g, God, of this world. That's how he's referred to in 2 Corinthians 4.4. He is that strong man who holds us captive, who oppresses us. And we need to be set free. We need to be liberated. But deliverance must come from a sphere, not our own. We're helpless, remember? There's nothing we can do. As Paul says in Ephesians 2, verse 2, we are under the dominion, the power, the control of the prince of the power of the air. That's our condition, B.C., before Christ. So Satan is the strong man who holds us captive. And there's nothing we can do to escape his dominion. Nothing. But thank God. Here's the good news of the gospel. Thank God someone stronger came in to our world, to our rescue. And that someone is Jesus Christ. He is the one, the stronger person, who strips Satan of his armor, his power, and distributes his plunder, who sets us free. And what it teaches us is that, yes, the strong man is strong, but our Redeemer is even stronger. That is the one we put our trust in. So folks, look at it from a biblical standpoint. When Jesus came to earth, make no mistake about it, a foreign evasion, a foreign invasion occurred when God's sphere of power invaded Satan's sphere of power and Satan lost. And God won. And Jesus was victorious. The strong man has been bound by someone stronger than him. And that's the victory that we have in Jesus. It's important to understand that if you're going to understand the redemptive story, the Bible story. So the Bible teaches us there are two opposing forces, two opposing dominions. And this earth is not a playground, but a battleground. And you're engaged on this battlefield whether you want to admit it or not. We are engaged in spiritual warfare. The Bible is filled with language about struggle and conflict and being prepared and being alert because our enemy goes about seeking those to destroy. The Bible is filled with military imagery For instance, in Ephesians 6, 11 and 12, here's one additional passage I want to share with you. Ephesians 6, 11 and 12, it says, put on the full armor of God. That's military language. Be prepared so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. 
For our struggle, there's military language, is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and powers, against the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places, in the unseen places. To use the analogy that Jesus gave, this is the strong man, the principalities of the power of the air, the strong man who oppresses us. And what it means is there's spiritual warfare going on. But because of Jesus' victory on the cross, we don't have to fear the devil. We don't have to live frightened. We can know that the victory ultimately will be ours. And so we don't choose weapons of violence to try and advance God's cause. Guns and bullets and bombs. That's not the weapons God wants us to use. The righteousness of man, the violence and anger of man, does not achieve the righteousness of God. James chapter 1 tells us that. So we don't rely on weapons of violence to advance God's cause. We choose weapons of nonviolence. Let me just share with you a little bit about God's plan. And the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, he says, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. That means physical weapons. In their day, it would be arrows and spears and swords. In our day, bullets and guns. But divinely, our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Again, military language. This is a military image being presented, a spiritual battle. And the way we win in our own personal lives, this battle is choosing weapons that are nonviolent. Weapons that are powerful for the destruction of fortresses. As you know, we live in a very divided world. Would you agree with that? (laughs) A very divided world. And it's getting further apart. It's becoming even more polarized. And you may have some people that you don't agree with, you don't like, they don't vote like you, and it's just a mess that we're coming in our world and in our country. Recognize the tension. But we're not going to resolve it through violence. Christianity, when acted properly, behaving properly, is not a violent faith. It's a peace-loving faith. We choose instead spiritual weapons not physical weapons. We choose instead the weapons, the spiritual weapons of prayer. Never underestimate the power of prayer. We choose the weapon of faith and hope and love and courage and truth. Satan hates the truth. He's a liar and a deceiver. That's why we need to stand up and have the courage to speak up about the truth as revealed in God's Word. That's our are weapons of this world, spiritual weapons. Now, I get it. Some Christians don't like the use of military language that we have in the Bible because of all the violence we have in our world today. Just think of what happened just this week on Tuesday down in the southern part of Texas. Unthinkable that this deranged young man would be driven to such extreme, demonic, horrible, unthinkable, We live in a violent world. That's true. I get that. But the Bible, nevertheless, teaches that we are engaged in spiritual warfare. Look how the family is under attack today. In every way, Satan is trying to destroy the family. Every way. There's a battle going on. But we choose to rely on the weapons God has given us, not the weapons of this world. Because we know that the ultimate victory, the sure victory, is through Christ. He is our champion who will conquer the forces of darkness. Now, folks, right now we live in middle ground. We live in the middle ground between the victory of Christ's first advent when he gave his life there on the cross and the victory of his second advent when he's coming in our future, and he's going to come, and he's going to come to our rescue on a white horse as King of kings and Lord of lords. He is coming to our rescue. (laughs) 
Wait for the second one. No second one. Okay. <laughs> that, that, that image of Christ riding on a horse is a military image. It's given in Revelation 19. It describes our champion, our hero coming ultimately to make all things right. So the victory we have is now, but not yet fully. You see how that is? He's already achieved the victory there on the cross when he gave his life for us. We can experience that victory right now, but not yet fully. We're still engaged in a battle. But one day, one day soon, Jesus is going to come again. In the meantime, until he does, until that trumpet sounds, we need to be faithful soldiers, living faithfully, courageously for Jesus Christ. As the hymn says, onward Christian soldiers, marching off to war, with the cross, notice, the cross of Jesus going on before. Christ, the royal master, leads against the foe. Forward into battle, see his banners go. You know, that song was written during a painful time in our nation's history. It was written during the Civil War in 1864. That was a tragic time in our nation's history, and it should remind us of what tragedy and Violence occurs when we choose weapons of violence. In fact, because of its imagery of battle, some Christian groups today have taken out this hymn from the hymn book. They don't want to sing it. But it's a great song because it reminds us that we need to stay faithful. It reminds us that the victory is in Christ, the cross of Jesus going on before. Right now, as we look at the world and the events of this world, the forces of darkness may seem to be winning. I mean, let's be honest. We can get discouraged. Evil and deception may seem to be prevailing. But it's not over yet. The bad news is going to get worse. The good news is ultimately going to get better. It's going to get worse before it gets better, but it will get better. Because one day, our champion, our hero will come. And he will make right all that is wrong in our world. What a day that's going to be. How many of you are looking forward to that day? I know I am. Soon, very soon, that trumpet will blast. And the white horse will appear. And our hero will come. And the battle belongs to the Lord. Never forget that. And that is true not only cosmically as far as God's redemptive plan. It's true in your life as well. God will guide you and strengthen you. Keep trusting in Him day by day and with each passing moment. I want to remind you of a great song. A mighty fortress is our God. It says, All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem. That's the ruler's crown, the victor's crown. And crown him Lord of all. Yes, Jesus is worthy of all praise and thanks, all honor and glory because of what he has achieved. Through Jesus, we have been liberated, set free from the power of sin, death, and the devil. And today there's many who say, well, there's no real such thing as a devil. Yes, there is. You just look what happened down in Texas this last week. If you doubt the reality of evil, the presence of the, of the evil one. But Jesus is going to get the victory. And we experience that victory now, but not yet fully. But that day will come. And if you haven't received Jesus as your Savior, if you haven't made that commitment, I want to encourage you and invite you to do that. That is the most important decision you can make, is to humble yourself and say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner like everyone else, and I put my faith in you and you alone for my salvation. Come in. Rescue me. We all need rescuing. Rescue me from my sins my brokenness set me free. If you haven't done that, if you haven't told Jesus that, today's the day. Let's do it now. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you that we can spend time looking at this very important theme. 
Jesus, when he came, was so humble, so meek. Oftentimes that's the image we're frozen with. But we need to see that he was engaged in battle. And that victory was achieved when he gave his life willingly to be crucified. A violent death. Satan thought he had him just where he wanted him. And Jesus actually had Satan just where he wants him. That's the beauty of the gospel. And it's through that death by our Lord that we can be set free from the evil powers of sin and death and the devil. Help us to live in that victory right now. Thank you for what you're doing. We pray that every heart that hears my voice today would receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We pray this now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.